Hello, everyone. This is probably going to be my last talk about the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Today, I would like to share with you my conclusions, basically a summary of my conclusions from the analysis that I made uh, on, this, on this pandemic. So I summarized my conclusions uh, in a few slides, which I will show to you. So I will again share my screen. Okay, there we go. So summary, key lessons learned and conclusions from my analysis on the uh, COVID-19 crisis. So the um, summary of my conclusions is as follows. And I would like, first of all, to say that um, a number of these conclusions can be immediately drawn from the lecture that I posted this morning on, um, on my website, and which basically explains that um, high infection rates in the population always lead to an erosion of the natural immunity in people that are naturally protected against the disease. And because of this erosion of the natural immunity in naturally protected people, it will lead, so this high infections rate will lead to an enhanced rate of uh, disease and even severe disease. So that is something important to realize. Um, uh, to explain this uh, relationship, uh, I would like to refer you to the lecture uh, I posted this morning on uh, the occurrence of asymptomatic uh, infection uh, caused by uh, COVID-19 or uh, by SARS-CoV-2 vi virus. So the other important thing re to realize is that on the other side, on the contrary, low infection rates in the population will lead to breeding, to a breeding of more infectious variants. Uh, how this works is also explained in the, uh, the lecture that I posted this morning. So for those who are less interested in the scientific arguments behind these conclusions, and I will read them for you, it will suffice uh, to see and to follow what is going to occur, what is going to happen in the next weeks uh, in, in several different countries where uh, currently the uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis is, is uh, still going on and uh, in some countries even intensifying. So what are the conclusions? Well, first of all, asymptomatic carriers, they will inevitably serve as a breeding ground for more infectious variants. So SARS-CoV-2 ensures its perpetuation in the population by infecting uh, people to some extent uh, in a non-symptomatic way. These asymptomatically infected people will be able to, um, to, to shed virus and this will do ultimately lead, as explained in the lecture I posted this morning, uh, will ultimately lead to more infectious uh, variants. So a second uh, conclusion is that mass implementation of stringent infection prevention measures will enhance breeding of more infectious variants and hence pose a higher threat to younger age groups or otherwise naturally protected subjects. So that what, what I was saying, uh, the higher the uh, inf infection rate in the population, and of course, if you have more infectious variants, the infection rate in the population will go up. This will always lead to an erosion of the natural immunity the, uh, mediated by natural antibodies in uh, people that are uh, naturally protected. So these are, uh, for example, young people, naturally protected people, or people who at the beginning of the pandemic are naturally protected because they have sufficient uh, sufficient uh, natural immunity. So by implementing stringent infection prevention measures, you will just enhance the breeding of more infectious variants. And that's what we have been seeing at the end of, uh, of last year, where all of a sudden after uh, uh, almost uh, 10 months of implementation of stringent infection prevention measures, we saw all of a sudden more infectious variants popping up. 
So third conclusion, mass vaccination campaigns will promote further breeding of variants that become even more infectious and will finally evolve into vaccine resistant variants. Again, how this comes is explained in the lecture I, uh, I, I put on the website this morning. And uh, because mass vaccination campaigns will promote this further breeding of even more infectious variants, uh, this will lead in, uh, so mass vaccination campaigns in elderly or otherwise vulnerable groups pose a higher threat to younger age groups or otherwise naturally protected subjects. And, and that is precisely because they, the vaccination of this, uh, this population will lead to a further breeding of uh, infectious variants that were already circulating in the population before the uh, mass vaccination campaign started. And the mass vaccination will just promote further breeding of these variants uh, so that they become even more infectious and therefore uh, become a higher threat to the younger age groups or other groups that are naturally protected. Uh, mass vaccination campaigns in elderly followed by mass vaccination of younger age groups pose an even higher threat to these groups, so to the younger age groups. And that is due to the fact that, uh, first of all, as I was just saying, mass vaccination campaigns in the elderly will make the already uh, circulating infectious, uh, highly infectious variants even more infectious. So the infection pressure in the population will still increase and on top by vaccinating the younger age groups, you will, uh, this will lead, of course, to a suppression of uh, natural antibody-mediated protection. So the uh, antibodies that are generated in the uh, younger age groups, they will increasingly prevent natural antibodies from uh, neutralizing the, uh, the virus, uh, from capturing the, the virus. And uh, so the combination of both the uh, erosion of the natural immunity combined with uh, a higher infection rate in the population due to mass vaccination campaigns in the elderly will ultimately uh, pose a, a very high threat to the younger age groups. Uh, the next conclusion, mass vac vaccination dramatically diminishes the effect of infection prevention uh, measures. So. Um, the more you vaccinate, the more you uh, progress with the mass vaccination, the uh, less the effect will be of infection prevention measures. Of course, except when you, if you do a complete lockdown and the virus can, so to say, no longer uh, propagate at all. But otherwise, uh, semi-lockdowns or uh, just uh, tightening up of infection prevention measures will have very, very, very little effect on the uh, effect of the mass vaccination. Um, okay, then vaccine resistance in elderly or otherwise vulnerable groups, so I mean the resistance of the, of the virus to the vaccine, uh, will of course pose a threat uh, to those groups themselves, but will also pose a threat to the non-vaccinated uh, people. And that is again, because if uh, people become resistant to the vaccine, then they will be able to support the uh, replication, the propagation of the virus. This will uh, indeed lead to an increase in the infection pressure in the population and therefore erode the um, uh, natural immunity of the non-vaccinated people, which will then in turn uh, enhance the uh, morbidity and mortality rate in those groups. So the next slide is uh, my conclusion that there is no proof of any beneficial effect of the COVID-19 mass vaccination campaigns at the level of the population. We do know, of course, that there is an individual uh, effect uh, or there is an effect at the individual level, uh, which I think is going to be transient. And uh, as already seen, uh, that there is increasing evidence that uh, the protection even against severe disease is, uh, is diminishing. So, but um, despite proven efficacy and safety in clinical trials, no doubt about this, of course. And uh, when, I, yeah, when I talk about, well, safety in clinical trials, of course, uh, we, we can only, or um, investigators could only evaluate this over the course 
and the duration of those clinical studies. If uh, we are now seeing additional uh, secondary effects or um, <clears throat> uh, safety issues, well, this is, uh, of course, due to the fact that uh, many more people are now receiving these vaccines and uh, the follow-up period of follow-up is just uh, being extended. But in principle, yes, those vaccines have been proven uh, efficacious and safe in, in the clinical trials. But despite that, there is no single indication that these vaccines protect the population when used in mass vaccination campaigns uh, uh, during a pandemic. And um, I would even say, on the contrary, mass vaccination enhances erosion of the natural part of herd immunity while preventing its replacement by adaptive uh, immunity. So uh, since we are uh, implementing this mass vaccination, we are, uh, for example, seeing a dramatic increase in the number of uh, infectious uh, or highly infectious variants in many, many, many countries that are now uh, uh, vaccinating full speed and have brought their vaccination rates up to uh, fairly high levels already. And uh, on top, not only that, uh, we are on top uh, also witnessing uh, very, very strong, very heavy waves of uh, morbidity and, uh, and also mortality in those countries. So there is, and I will come back, of course, to the case, a typical case of uh, Israel and, uh, and UK, um, uh, where people are saying, well, uh, you see that uh, vaccine mass vaccination does have an effect. Uh, I will, I explained previously, and I will show you again, that um, the, what we are seeing right now in those countries uh, has nothing to do with the success of mass vaccination campaigns. So more and more conventional vaccines are being developed. So, I mean, if people were so convinced that these are the vaccines uh, to use, then uh, one is wondering, of course, why there are so many uh, different other uh, vaccines that are being developed and not only uh, variations on the S protein, and with variations on the S protein, but also several different, uh, several different concepts. Well, when I look at these vaccines, uh, I still consider them as being conventional vaccines in the sense that they do nothing else than mimicking the uh, immune response that is induced by natural infection, uh, at least as far as the S protein uh, is concerned, and that they have no sterilizing, they do not uh, induce a sterilizing immunity. So it is my conviction that none of these vaccines will be able uh, to control the more infectious variants nor uh, to generate adaptive herd immunity, which uh, was proposed to be the end game of the uh, mass vaccination. So um, if now there is a discussion that uh, people are saying, well, in those countries that are um, vaccinating really like hell, and where there is no improvement uh, in, in the rates of infection and disease on the contrary, of course, it's easy to say, yeah, it's why, because we have not uh, vaccinated sufficient people. We, we, need, we need to continue this, uh, this vaccine, this uh, mass vaccination campaigns and uh, to increase the vaccination rates before we will ultimately see an effect. So what I'm saying is that mass vaccination do nothing else, mass vaccinations do nothing else than, um, first of all, uh, driving, promoting the, um, the generation of uh, more infectious variants, and uh, second, also uh, increasing or enhancing waves of mortality and morbidity in uh, people who were naturally protected by virtue of uh, a strong natural immunity. And uh, that is because the two are related, of course, more infectious variants uh, increase the infection rate in the population. And as I'm always saying, this infection rate is ultimately going to erode the innate immunity in uh, people who were uh, naturally protected, uh, especially young people, but um, also uh, people who have are in good health, in good shape, uh, and and dispose of um, high levels of natural antibodies. So uh, in order to sort out this uh, eternal uh, question or discussion, I've been asking for, the, for, for defining objective criteria, objective criteria that could be considered as reliable indicators of 
enhanced fitness of more infectious immune escape variants. So if we would agree, if we could agree, okay, tell us what, uh, what are the indicators that uh, clearly point to an enhanced fitness of uh, these more infectious uh, immune escape variants. And the, uh, if we have this criterion, then we could, of course, uh, ask the next question, which is very important. How do we now investigate whether or not there is a true correlation uh, between these criteria, uh, criteria and the external influences that we are applying to this pandemic? So the external influences, uh, such as those brought about by pharmaceutical or non-pharmaceutical uh, intervention, this is to say mass vaccination or stringent infection prevention measures. So my fear is, and that is what I, I see coming, unfortunately, is that the health authorities will only admit uh, the disaster of the mass vaccination when there is complete resistance to the vaccine and when this complete resistance to the vaccine will result in huge morbidity and mortality rates, not only in the vaccinees, because the vaccinees, of course, uh, if there is resistance, their antibodies will no longer work. And uh, what, what they still will do is to suppress the natural uh, immunity of, uh, of, of these people. And uh, because then the infection pressure will tremendously increase, even the non-vaccinated people uh, will be threatened and will be subject to uh, enhanced disease. And my fear is, is, is that it's only when we are going to see this happen and that is what I predict, unfortunately, will happen, that authorities will admit that something went wrong. So, um, well, let me uh, quickly show these uh, curves. I've uh, been showing them on previous occasions, but it's always good to uh, repeat. Uh, here you can see, for example, uh, how uh, countries uh, like uh, India had uh, a second wave that uh, was, well, it's not very close to the first wave, but when we compare this with what happened in our countries, uh, the, the, the second or the, the more pronounced wave that we saw, uh, and, and, that, and that was also including younger subjects, uh, was, uh, came, pretty, came pretty late. So there was, uh, in terms of um, time, uh, several, several months between uh, the first wave and uh, the wave, uh, the more important waves that uh, were also including younger subjects. So in, in India, for example, we see that uh, this wave, uh, despite the low infection pressure at uh, this plateau here, uh, is, uh, is, is increasing pretty steeply. And, I, and, and it's also uh, following pretty closely just a few months, uh, half a year maximum, uh, less of course, uh, let's, let's say four months after uh, the, uh, the first wave ended. Uh, I think it's very, very likely that in fact mass vaccination, which was enhancing, enhancing the development of more infectious variants, is contributing to the steep increase in, uh, in the disease rate uh, in, uh, in India. As I was saying, higher infection rates, you get higher infection rates when more, um, uh, when more infectious uh, variants are, uh, are circulating or when you're generating more infectious variants. And that is precisely what uh, I think mass vaccination is doing. So it, it, it's, it's not surprising then that due to this high infection pressure, you all of a sudden get uh, a very substantial erosion of innate immunity in people who were previously uh, protected and uh, are now uh, part of this uh, important wave of uh, disease uh, seen in India. Uh, in other countries, for example, Brazil, Chile, uh, Uruguay, uh, again, you saw this uh, very steep increase in the, in the second wave uh, even before the previous wave uh, came to an end. Normally the wave comes to an end, you, you go down, you, you come to a plateau, and then you can see a second peak. But of course, if you now have mass vaccination, which started here approximately, and the mass vaccination is again 
contributing to enhance infectiousness of an, a strain of an, uh, a strain that was already highly infectious, namely the Brazil strain that, that is circulating in these countries. Uh, when on top you are uh, whipping up the uh, infectiousness of this strain by doing the mass vaccination, then it's no surprise that the second wave will almost immediately, a second wave of uh, disease, also including younger people, will, will occur even before the previous wave uh, has come down. So, uh, and, and then what about these uh, countries, uh, you know, where you have the success stories, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, in Israel, and, uh, well, was also hoped for in the United States, but of course, in the United States, the, uh, um, the slopes are again uh, increasing. And, uh, but, but let's look at the, the case of the United Kingdom and uh, Israel. Here, this was claimed to be a success of the vaccine, this, this uh, sharp uh, decrease, which is not at all the case, because uh, here we started the mass vaccination at the very peak of the infection. And we know if you have this peak of infection, then uh, this, this really reflects the high susceptibility, the high vulnerability of uh, people who got as a result of the previous wave, who got their uh, um, natural antibodies suppressed by suboptimal uh, anti-spike uh, antibodies that resulted from previous infection, so in asymptomatically infected people. And um, when you have uh, these uh, people who now uh, get, of course, the disease, etc., they will develop antibodies, uh, they will get protected, and then the remainder of these um, asymptomatically infected people, they still have antibodies that are high enough natural antibodies to prevent, in fact, uh, the, the virus from spreading at, uh, at high speed. Why? Because the virus is now circulating in that population, but asymptomatically infected um, uh, subjects will only uh, spread, uh, well, will spread less virus and also the amount of these um, asymptomatically infected people after a, a vast or a large part of them have already been infected and got the disease here, the remainder uh, comprises a smaller part of the population. They spread the virus pretty slowly and hence the infection rate uh, goes down. Uh, this has, uh, in fact, nothing to do with the mass vaccination. Uh, for example, here in the UK, you got uh, within a few weeks, uh, two or three weeks, a drop of 50% Whereas at that point in time, the vaccination rate was barely between uh, 2 and 10 percent. So much, much lower than, for example, vaccination rates that were um, uh, in, in Chile associated with uh, a very strong increase, in, increase, in fact, in the um, uh, rates of uh, infection and disease. So when this happened here in Chile, well, we had already vaccination rates uh, around 40 percent. So um, there, is no, uh, there is no way to say that this is due to, uh, to the vaccination. And uh, this leaves, uh, of course, people with a very false uh, impression that in those countries, you got uh, a success story because the, the decrease was simply due to the fact that uh, the mass vaccination was started uh, um, at the very uh, peak height of the, um, of, of, uh, of the pandemic. And uh, then, of course, you get this uh, kind of plateau, as I was saying, where the infection rate is low, but which simply reflects breeding of even more infectious variants uh, due also to the mass vaccination. You have the infectious strains already circulating. Mass vaccination will even uh, further enhance the, uh, infect the inf infectiousness of, uh, of those variants. And uh, it will evolve up to a point where you have resistance. And then you will see in, in those countries like the United Kingdom, like Israel, that all of a sudden you have a steep increase in uh, cases. Um, OK, so what is the bottom line? So the mantra of vaccination that uh, the more people you vaccinate, the less viral replication you have, and hence the fewer more infectious variants you will have, this does not apply at all. Please forget about this mantra. It is so wrong. Why? Well, it does not take uh, into account 
um, the most fundamental mechanism of uh, evolutionary biology, which is uh, natural selection. And uh, natural selection is uh, often described as um, uh, survival of, of the fittest. Uh, so the, uh, the strains that are, or the variants that um, are most fit, that are the fittest, they will be selected and they will have an, uh, an advantage, uh, a competitive advantage. So this natural selection, in other words, is promoting the survival and the propagation of a highly infectious variants, which indirectly, as I explained, cause enhanced morbidity and mortality in previously naturally protected uh, subjects. So this mantra doesn't apply because infectivity is going to go up dramatically because you are selecting and adapting highly infectious variants, even more so when you vaccinate, and those will uh, be uh, the cause of enhanced um, morbidity and mortality, especially in people who see their natural immunity eroded, and these are uh, particularly people who were naturally protected at the beginning of the pandemic. So I've been calling, I've been asking, I've been begging to stop mass vaccination. This was my first call to the WHO. I would add to this, please, especially in youngsters, because this is going to be really a catastrophe. Uh, not only will mass, is mass vaccine, vaccination driving the generation of even more infectious variants that have already a very detrimental impact on uh, the younger population because it erodes their uh, natural immunity, but on top by vaccinating them, these youngsters, you will, you will of course uh, generate uh, long-lived antibodies that will suppress their natural immunity. And of course, when resistance, uh, full resistance will come to, uh, to the vaccine, then these youngsters are left uh, with nothing at all. So their uh, vaccinal antibodies will no work anymore, but they will also see uh, their innate immunity uh, suppressed for, uh, for uh, a long time uh, due to this uh, long-lived uh, vaccinal antibodies. So I then, in a second call to the WHO, I asked to set up a task force concentrating on three items. First, eradicate the viral variants, because I see no other way to get rid of those to focus on early treatment that we can at least treat uh, people at a very, very early stage of disease, avoiding uh, for them to have to go to the hospital and to be put on, on mechanical ventilators. And, and my the third um, topic for this task for, force I was asking for was um, to concentrate on uh, health and, uh, and natural immunity. So we know that uh, good health, uh, healthy lifestyle, healthy food, uh, healthy uh, living habits, etc., cetera, uh, are correlated with uh, good levels of natural antibodies. So uh, good lifestyle, healthy life is uh, very, very important. But again, no response either to the first call nor to the second call. Now, my last call is really to develop as up uh, natural killer cell-based vaccine candidates. Why? Well, we know that in uh, asymptomatically infected people, the virus can be completely eliminated at a very early stage of the disease by NK cells. And, uh, but uh, in fact, any kind of, of vaccine that would induce sterilizing immunity would do the job. But practically speaking, I uh, see no other approach than an NK cell based uh, uh, vaccine approach. So uh, I have been uh, uh, offering my help on this. Um, uh, there has been no response either. Of course, against by fact checkers, uh, I will be um, uh, I will be considered or uh, labeled as a, you know uh, as, as a vicious guy. This will be again one of my vicious traits that I am advocating for NK cell based. Uh, uh, vaccines to be uh, developed. I sincerely think that uh, this is really the best way uh, to go and uh, without any personal uh, benefit or profit or whatsoever, I can only say I'm able to, I, I'm willing uh, to help uh, collaborating on such uh, vaccines. 
And uh, it could even be that uh, we don't know that all the vertebrate species are infected as well. We, I don't know uh, what is the situation like with our livestock, for example, where we have high concentrations of animals sitting on uh, very small surfaces like in the uh, uh, pig and poultry industry. And with all these variants appearing, uh, with all these changes in the S-protein, we know that also these uh, um, changes in S-protein are responsible uh, for um, uh, crossing uh, species barriers. So uh, I'm not so sure that none of these variants uh, could be hosted by uh, any of uh, the livestock uh, in our countries. So if that is the case, I mean, uh, vaccine, the vaccination may need to be extended to those animal species as well. And then I uh, think it's also critical to uh, develop as soon as possible a reliable in-home serological kits so that people can self-test uh, for uh, anti-S antibodies. So basically speaking, if you have no anti-S antibodies, uh, you can reasonably assume that your uh, natural immunity is not eroded. And when on top you are in good health, well, you should have a reasonable good level of natural antibodies, not, not suppressed by any uh, anti-S antibodies. If you're negative in such an, an essay, of course, uh, the tests need to be reliable because uh, you cannot afford, of course, having uh, false uh, negative uh, results. But if that is the case and your natural antibodies are not suppressed and you're in good health, well, basically you should be able to cope with any, with any kind of uh, infectious variant uh, without having to suffer from uh, severe disease. So why do we always need to learn everything the hard way? And I'm anticipating because I've done a proper homework and I fear that uh, my conclusions will apply um, you know, it's uh, everyone will be able to check in the in the next coming weeks. But I here we conclude my homework, and I think my messages have been very clear. And um, we will ask ourselves the question: Well, why did we need to go through this pain, and why did we uh, not uh, learn things uh, before? And 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 we we only learn when uh, catastrophes happen. Well, I see a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, there is many unresolved questions with this, and I put a number of questions on my website, que questions that have not been resolved, questions that have not been addressed, and it's always very, very dangerous to implement um, uh, to implement uh, interventions on, on, on very large populations, to do large-scale uh, interventions, for example, in terms of immunization, in terms of um, infection prevention, if you don't really uh, understand what is going on and if you cannot uh, answer some, some basic and, uh, and very, very um, important questions, questions that are not, cannot be answered by the simplistic uh, mantra of conventional vaccination. Uh, uh, I refer for those questions to my website, but I've uh, just uh, listed a few, for example, why you get uh, all of a sudden after this mass vaccination implementation, this fulminant increase in infectious variants, right? Why uh, do we, so to say, uh, have success in, in, in certain countries, whereas there is no success in other countries? I explained this to some extent that there is a misinterpretation of the effect of the, of the mass vaccination. Uh, why today we can't predict uh, curves anymore? If you uh, hear the epidemiologists, well, uh, they don't even know, they can no longer tell whether a curve will go up, down, uh, will go down, up, or, or, or stay at the plateau. And so why all of a sudden, we see after um, some smaller initial waves, we see all of a sudden these big waves of disease where also a number of young people are uh, part of. And um, for example, yeah, how is the virus cleared in asymptomatically uh, infected uh, people? I mean, I am pretty much convinced that uh, this is due to NK cells, but uh, there has been no uh, general consensus or even a debate on this. So this is the first thing. We leave many unresolved questions on the table. Second, we don't listen to insights of others. Uh, nowadays, if you are not an officially recognized expert or you don't have this kind of world reputation or you are not a professor 
or you're not having a sufficient number of uh, publications, well, uh, people don't listen to you. And uh, so it's not about really solving global health problems. It's more like focusing on uh, people's uh, bio, on uh, people's track, track record. And uh, I think it's not because uh, you don't have all of these credentials that you don't have brains and that you cannot do a proper homework. So another reason why I think we uh, always need to learn everything the hard way is that we are nowadays more focused on technologies than we are focused on fundamental principles of uh, biology. Uh, also, we think too much in silos. Everyone has uh, his own uh, field of specialty of expertise Whereas uh, solving complex problems like uh, solving a global health problem, uh, it requires a multidisciplinary approach. You have to draw from evolutionary biology, from immunology, from vaccinology, from virology, etc. We don't do that enough uh, because we are too focused, too much focused on, on our silos. And um, I think our society is also increasingly developing what I call uh, hurt behavior or hurt mentality rather than hurt immunity, actually. And uh, so what you can see is that, uh, for example, the politicians are blindly following the key experts and the key experts are blindly following the WHO. And uh, the WHO is, uh, kind of like uh, sticking to their global mandate. But as uh, a result, people have no choice but to follow, in fact, the leaders of the pack. And um, what those are saying right now is, uh, well, we call this in French, sois belle et tais-toi. So which means uh, uh, be nice, be beautiful, but shut up and just get yourself vaccinated. And that is certainly uh, an, uh, a situation, a mentality that is unacceptable. And uh, we, we more and more live in, in, a kind of, uh, in a kind of society or climate right, right now where no other opinions seem to be uh, tolerated, even, even if they are based on, on, on science. So I have been calling really for solidarity but in return, uh, I got a number of uh, biologically naive fact checkers on my back. And uh, these guys are pretty unscrupulous in that they uh, blindly engage into uh, politically orchestrated efforts to silence uh, any opposition, uh, even, even if that opposition is based on science. They are all about... Uh, uh, bashing and, and debunking and uh, censoring uh, websites, uh, preventing dissemination of uh, scientific uh, information uh, through several different media. Um, so this is, uh, this is really a shame. And not only that, but also experts who have been criticizing me out of their ivory tower and hiding behind their name, their reputation or their institution. Uh, instead, instead, of course, of engaging into a multidisciplinary discussion, I've often called to have this multidisciplinary discussion, it's easy uh, to, to sit in your office and to talk to fact checkers and then give your opinion and then the fact checkers, as the postman, they uh, confront you with, with, with his opinions. I mean, that doesn't add anything uh, that has no value at all. So instead of solidarity, what we are seeing are coalitions that drive mass vaccination campaigns. Coalitions of people with conflicts of interest, be they political, commercial, or reputational interests, and all hiding behind each other. So I think this must stop, and I'm again asking colleagues and experts not at least in my own country, to abandon this poor and hypocritical attitude and to collaborate on a constructive instead of a destructive way. So um, I think, and that is, what, that is really what my forecast is, because I don't think this will have a happy end, and certainly not if we continue like this. I think it will even go to the point where the word vaccine, the term vaccine, will be banned 
from the medical vocabulary. We vaccinologists have uh, uh, paid a lot of attention and uh, invested a lot of time and energy in convincing people of the usefulness uh, and the benefit of vaccination, I think these efforts will be completely lost. We will never have uh, that as many anti-vaxxers as we have already right now, and as we will certainly have uh, at the end of the, uh, of the pandemic. So I propose to replace the term vaccine, which is referring to the conventional vaccines that we are using to conditional immune protection induce, inducing formulation. It's a long word, but the, the abbreviation would be CIPIV or CIPIV, but the word conditional is important. Why is this uh, important? Because we need to learn that we can, that uh, conventional vaccines can be very, very useful, but we can only use them in a beneficial way, provided certain conditions are fulfilled. So why am I saying this? Well, because the efficiency of conventional vaccines that are basically just mimicking uh, immunity elicited by natural infection can only work provided in these certain conditions uh, are fulfilled. And I give you some examples. Uh, we have seen, for example, uh, vaccination with live vectors um, against Ebola in uh, people that were uh, in the incubation time. So because uh, there were contacts from cases and they were uh, in a ring trial, they were vaccinated with a live uh, vector, knowing that some people of these people are in the incubation time. So this can lead to disastrous, uh, to disastrous results. And now we have a new example uh, that we use conventional vaccines for doing mass vaccination in the heat of a pandemic. And it is really a very, very bad idea because it's just making the whole situation much, much worse. So with that, I would um, like to thank, of course, all the people who have uh, helped uh, me in, in, and, and still help me in disseminating and getting out the word and getting out the scientific uh, information to help uh, disseminate this, uh, uh, this, this uh, scientific message uh, by ways of uh, several different means. Uh, uh, some have used their um, broadcasting platforms, uh, have made their uh, broadcasting platforms available. And uh, by doing so, we uh, got uh, our message disseminated uh, uh, by podcasts or even um, live stream shows. So I, I'm very grateful for the help of all these people. And uh, uh, we have avoided to use um, uh, platforms that uh, are specifically labeled as anti-vax platforms because the message uh, really is not uh, against vaccination. It's, it, it is really against uh, vaccination under um, inadequate uh, conditions, as I, um, as I try to point out. I would uh, like to specifically uh, thank uh, my nephew and my uh, brother-in-law who have been providing me on a completely, completely voluntary basis with their unconditional logistic support, uh, their trust, confidence and, and, and dedication in the fight against this, this madness and, and in the battle to make science and, and, and justice prevail. So um, in fact, after all this, I barely dare to look in your, into your face as I know that what, what I've been saying is, is, is incredibly bad news. And so there is always uh, an option to not say anything at all. I, I could have just, you know, have kept silent and it would have made my, my, uh, my life much uh, easier. But um, uh, knowing what I know and looking at what is currently happening uh, in this world and also knowing that there is still a very narrow window of opportunity for turning the tide, uh, I felt like sharing this with you is, is simply a moral obligation. And um, last but not least, um, well, I'm, I'm not religious, but frankly speaking, I'm hoping for a miracle. And if God cannot do this, we as a human species need to make this happen.
थैंक यू